GSK's academic discovery uh, unit, which is a small group within GSK um, that work particularly with academics on a wide portfolio of early development um, assets. So that, that's a little bit about my background. But um, I just wanted to begin with um, a definition. Uh, we've deliberately called this translational pharmacology, not simply because of the, the audience, but because we wanted to draw in this idea that this is not simply translational medicine. It's broader than that. I'm not going to read out this definition, but what I think the key points from it are that pharmacologists, whether they are clinical pharmacologists or not, all have important uh, contributions to make to modern uh, drug development, whether that be through biomarkers, identifi identification of key points in the, in the disease pathway, which would lead on to uh, patient um, selection. And that's really what we're trying to bring to this. It's, it's the whole pharmacological uh, universe that is important here. We do live in, a, in an age of unprecedented um, uh, scientific innovation. There's um, a, a burgeoning of the numbers of journals. Journals are uh, fuller than they have ever been. There are uh, more, uh, there's more in the media all of the time. But at the same time, despite this biomedical explosion, the number of new medicines that have been uh, registered is falling, and falling quite substantially. These are, uh, are figures from, from the FDA. And the biological medicines uh, that are coming through and coming through in more substantial numbers are not fully filling this gap. So we are, despite the uh, huge increase in uh, uh, in scientific knowledge, not being able to translate that into uh, meaningful medicines uh, for patients as efficiently as we were 10, 15 uh, years ago. And that's what we want to um, focus on. There's a really big pull uh, from industry in this, uh, in this uh, arena. Modern drug development is too costly. Um, it takes too long. The estimates are now approximately a billion dollars for, for a new medicine, though I'm sure it, it does vary. But if you look at the, at the gross figures, it comes up with something scary like that. It's also pretty clear that the blockbuster model, which has been the, the model for many big pharma companies over the last uh, 10, 15 years, is probably not the way forward and is not really sustainable. And there is substantial increasing focus on much smaller smaller, better defined uh, disease states. But with that, in order to support um, the, the size of these companies, we're going to need to focus on many more diseases. Um, and that means there's going to be an expertise gap, particularly within uh, pharmaceutical companies. So pharmaceutical companies increasingly look into pharmacologists and clinical pharmacologists and disease area experts to help guide them in these um, in these new disease states, which are very often unfamiliar and not disease states that pharma has traditionally uh, been active um, in, in. In addition to this proliferation of science, there's, been a, there's a proliferation of, uh, of potential uh, interventions. There are still small chemicals, and I think many of us believe that they will still have an important place uh, in the therapeutic armamentarium of the future. Biopharmaceuticals have earned their place and are growing very rapidly. But there's a whole proliferation of other potential targets, siRNA, stem cells, other cell types. If you're a pharmaceutical company, it is not possible to be an expert, to have the depth of knowledge, to be able to develop every single one of these. And therefore, one needs partners who do understand these novel technologies, that often very many of which are new, and therefore the number of people who know about them is quite small. And so there is a very big push from industry to move to academics who do understand these things and have been working on them for um, quite some time. We're also, uh, the, the, the endpoints that we're looking at now are much more distal, much more complex. We're looking at disease uh, modification, disease modification, rather than symptomatic relief. And so, again, you need to have a dis deep understanding of the disease state, the natural history of that disease, the mod modulations that patients go through in order to be able to design appropriate endpoints uh, for clinical trials. 
At the same time, there has been within the academic field um, a, a real push from uh, the policy makers and the people who hold the purse strings to, um, for a much greater focus on um, translational science and translational medicine um, in particular. There are substantial new streams, um, whether they're completely new or re-diversion of streams from other areas, I think is a moot point. But either way, um, translational science has got specific uh, streams from MRC and uh, welcome now. And uh, there is an expectation, I think, in all grant applications that the translational aspects need to be uh, emphasized. We're also seeing with the uh, formation of academic health science centers a structural reorganization of academic institutions, in those cases in partnership with the NHS, which means that the, the landscape that we're looking at, the structural um, uh, landscape that we're looking at, it is, is changing uh, rapidly. And a lot of that focus is around translational aspects um, of disease not only at early phase, but also uh, in the implementation uh, part of that um, uh, of, of translational um, science. But that later implementation piece is not really our focus today. It's the, it's the early phase. So we've got two well-developed, highly, um, highly developed worlds here, both of whom have been working together, but I would suggest have not been working together optimally for quite some time. There is a big pull from one and there's a big push from another. Now, this could result in a fabulous new um, future of uh, great partnerships, but as with any, uh, whenever you um, get two worlds colliding, that could lead to a black hole, and that's really what we've got to um, avoid. And that's where I think it is important that we think about the structure, and that's going to be the focus of today, the structure of the, the, the collaborations that we put together so that they are of common purpose and mutually uh, satisfying to both um, parties. I just want to share with you um, a, a survey we conducted um, uh, recently in the academic DPU looking at our academic partners. You'll see from this uh, majority are uh, from the UK. You're never quite sure where you're going to get uh, replies from uh, in, when you send these surveys out. So we do have Turkey slightly overrepresented, I would suggest, uh, in, in this. But um, we, we've got close to 100 responses, the majority of whom uh, have worked um, with industry. And we asked them two uh, fundamental questions. One, what, does, what makes for a, a successful um, collaboration? Freedom to publish is very important for academics but also the access to the partners' capabilities, a recognition that industry does have access to capabilities that are not available readily within the academic um, uh, framework, and that's important. The formation of milestone payments, i.e. milestone payments that are associated with work done um, are, are important. But critically, the most important thing was a common purpose and an aim of the partnership, and I think that's a really important message um, for us when we're thinking about um, success. The downside is what, what makes for unsuccessful um, collaborations. You'll see the issues around intellectual property which are traditionally rolled out as the reasons um, for um, the failure of academic industrial collaborations do appear but they're rather less Im important in uh, this group's mind th than some other things. Not least um, re restrictions on delay in publication, but also early project termination due to a change in industrial strategy. And that comes up time and time again. And again, I think this is something that we can do something um, about. But also a changing point of contact. Academics not knowing who it is they need to speak to and not knowing who, who that person is that they need to work with within the industrial um, group. So, just thinking about this in, in basic terms, what can we do to really try to improve these things um, in the future? And I think it really is this identification of commonality uh, of purpose. I think all too often in the past, collaborations have been driven by the prestige of the academic partner or a particular desire to work with an academic institution. It is critical that when we're thinking about forming these um, uh, partnerships in the future, that it's really around the science, that it's driven by that, and that the partnership is based around that rather than um, other factors. 
I think it's also critical that we think about the connections that we make between the two partners, that those are made at the right level. I, it is no use the senior executive of research making an arrangement with the vice chancellor um, of a university, which is, or then gets signed through, if the individual departments and the department heads are not brought into those, these agreements. Because these are the people who have to make these things work in, in, in practice. And again, that is something, it's relatively straightforward to do up front. Trying to fix it once you actually have an agreement in place leads to substantial delays uh, and frustrations on, on both sides. Intellectual property is important, but as we've seen, it's not always the most important thing um, because, again, I think it's relatively um, fixable. Industry needs to be much more realistic about what can be shared and what, can, what needs to be protected. And I think there is an increasing realisation that attempting to nail down the whole of the intellectual property landscape around a particular target or molecule is neither feasible nor particularly helpful to the development of the science or that molecule. And I think we are seeing changes. They may be slow, but I think we are seeing changes in there. But I think on the academic side, I think there is sometimes an unrealistic um, valuation of the intellectual property that is generated. Um, and that can be a barrier to the formation of, uh, of appropriate uh, collaborations. This is just a, a, a landscape of the different kinds of collaboration. I think the, uh, the one company, one investigator, which is the, probably the most common, uh, is going to still be the most common. But you'll see an increasing number of these other forms of, of collaboration taking place. But again, I think the guiding principle needs to be that this, it's being driven by the science rather than I'm GSK, I want to work with Harvard, I don't really care what they're doing in Harvard, but Harvard are prestigious and I wish to work with them. So it is important that we drive these things around particular pieces of science. There are very good examples of collaborations um, in, uh, in all of these arenas, but that in all of those cases they have been driven by the science rather than a desire uh, than other co um, uh, considerations. We've seen less of the, of the things towards the bottom, but I think we are going to see um, venture capital investment and unusual funding structures where you get spin-out companies, perhaps funded in part by industry, in part by the venture capital arm of, uh, of an academic institution um, coming forward. I think it is, it's a common criticism of, uh, of industry that uh, academics feel they are used for fee-for-service um, within these uh, collaborations. And I think that's an important thing to take on board. If you're entering into a collaboration, it's not a fee-for-service um, arrangement. And there should be some proper collaboration in there. To be honest, if you want to enter into a fee-for-service um, arrangement with a, uh, with a partner, whether academic or, or industrial, then that's what it should be and that should be transparent and we shouldn't dress these things up as uh, collaborations when in fact they're not. Setting up these collaborations takes a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of effort and there's usually a few bottles of champagne that are cracked at the point you actually get to signing the deal. The tragedy is that very often within months of of that moment, uh, the, uh, the, the collaboration is, is in trouble. And that's where I think pu pu putting in proper governance structures is absolutely critical. And again, these are relatively straightforward if you set them up properly right from the start, but they're much more difficult to do when you, if you try and fix them halfway through. Is there a proper oversight steering committee who understand the policy and the strategic aim of of this uh, collaboration? Do they really all understand that and is that joined up? Is there a proper single point of contact on both sides? And if that person does move on, is somebody else appointed to really carry on this um, collaboration? And trust takes time to develop. We've both got to understand one another's ways of working. And I think particularly for the industrial partners, it's very important not to be dogmatic about particular ways of working, particular standard operating procedures, etc., because those can be a barrier to successful collaboration, particularly with academic groups. The other thing that I think we don't do well, but I think it's critical 
to making these things a success is plan for the fact that these might not go the way that we expect them to do. Attrition within pharmaceutical development is absolutely enormous. The moment you enter into collaboration, the most likely thing that's going to happen is that it fails, that the target or the molecule fails. It doesn't mean the collaboration needs to fail. But very often we don't consider right up at the front what if the molecule or the target goes down for whatever reason? What in this collaboration are we going to carry on with? Who's going to allocate those resources? And it's very important, I think, to have these conversations up front so that there's a common understanding. Because very often people's salaries and livelihoods are involved uh, in these decisions. And when, um, uh, when a molecule goes down and, it, and the, the funding source is switched off, that can lead to uh, very acrimonious uh, discussions. And really, that for me is a failure of the collaboration, not just the, the target. Whereas I've seen some very good examples where the target or molecule has gone down, but the collaboration has been successful and actually some very valuable work has been um, conducted. This push between the worlds of academia and, and industry is going to happen anyway. There are very great forces at work on both sides pushing these two things um, together. What today is about is thinking, stepping back for a moment and thinking about what is it that we can do to make these things successful because many people have examples of successful collaborations, but they also have an equal number of unsuccessful collaborations. In order to make this work better, and uh, for uh, the future of biomedical science, I think, within the UK, we need to be seen as a place that is really capable of doing this um, very well. There are structural things going on um, on, on the academic side, such as the formation of academic health sciences centres. You're seeing different initiatives from, um, uh, from industry there. I just mentioned the Lilly PD2, PD squared um, initiative, which gives um, certain institutions access to screening uh, pieces. And we're about to launch um, uh, a, a pharma and partnership um, collaboration, which is offering up molecules and mechanisms, We're inviting academics to, to essentially put in grant proposals for the early development of, the, of those molecules. So there's lots of things happening. The critical thing is how do we make these um, things successful? And why is that important? Well, in 2002, the UK got 6% of the world's um, clinical trial um, uh, expenditure. By 2007, it had fallen to 2%. The UK has a really strong history in biomedical science and, and translational um, science, but we are losing the battle at the moment. And if we don't step up to this, then that, that share of the pie will fall, fall further. And it's, funding is important, but it's not the only thing here. We've got to find ways to work more effect, effectively and more efficiently um, together. So with that, um, I'll end. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.